After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference may be recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Darren G., President and CEO. Please go ahead. All right. Well, thanks, Josh. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to uh, PATO's second quarter 2021 results conference call. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to remind everybody that all statements made by the company during this call are subject to the forward-looking disclaimer and advisory set forth in the company's news release issued yesterday. In the room with me today, we've got pretty much all the Beto management team. We've got J.P. Lachance, our VP Engineering and Chief Operating Officer, Kathy Turgeon, our Chief Financial Officer, uh, Scott Robinson's here, our VP of Business Development, Dave Thomas, our VP of Exploration, uh, we've got Todd Burdick, our VP of Production here, and Derek Zember, our VP of Land. Uh, the only one missing is uh, Lee Kern, our VP Drilling and Completion. He's uh, tied up this morning covering some operations on the drilling side. Uh, before I get started with uh, comments about the quarter today, I do want to recognize the efforts of both our office and field personnel this past quarter. They continue to conduct operations with safety foremost in mind and Although we're coming out of the COVID pandemic, uh, that's still very much uh, in everybody's mind uh, in terms of uh, uh, health and safety of our people. And of course, as always, we've got operational risks when we've got uh, a lot of rigs running as we do now uh, that we have to keep track of on an ongoing basis. We haven't had any uh, major incidents or outbreaks of COVID that shut us down, which has been really good. Um, especially considering we do have active drilling crews and frack crews and pipeline crews all working uh, within our areas of operations and our own people obviously working in and around plants, uh, doing turnarounds this quarter particularly um, and even into Q3 here. And so we've, uh, we've done a great job, I think, uh, keeping the pandemic at bay and it was another strong safety quarter. So uh, well done, everyone. Uh, on to second quarter results. Uh, operationally, drilling and completions were very successful in the quarter, uh, with breakup obviously shutting us down in the middle of the quarter. I think breakup this year was more or less normal in terms of uh, how long we had to stay shut down to uh, see the frost come out of the ground and to dry everything out so we could move around again. Uh, we did shut two rigs down during breakup for some maintenance and uh, upgrades, and that kept them on the sidelines, unfortunately, longer than we had hoped. Uh, we were getting some upgrades that were making them more efficient, so we're happy to see that, but we were hoping to get them back to work a little sooner than that. And we came back after our breakup, obviously, a little bit behind our capital program and our drilling schedule, and that combined with some unexpected participation by uh, one of our partners meant that uh, our net drilling activity was a little more behind than what we were scheduling in Q2, and uh, we want to catch up to that, so we've added a fifth rig as of the start of August, and that fifth rig should help us catch up uh, even more than uh, what we missed there by the end of the year. So we'll be in, in good position going into the winter for some, uh, some strong gas prices. Production uh, held up pretty well in the quarter, despite the fact that we uh, didn't add as, as many uh, new wells, obviously, in Q2, t typical with breakup, than we do in, in Q1 or other quarters. Um, and our, our runtime was really good, other than that really hot week in June that impacted both ours and, and even more so the northern gas plants' throughput. Um, what happens in the hot weather is that the big engines on those gas compressors begin to labor uh, due to high temperature and end up getting either slowed down or even shut in. And we definitely saw that in that last week of June where at times we saw Nova receipts drop from 12 BCF a day to 8 BCF a day in the heat of the day. Um, and so you know, our compressors are designed for some relatively hot summer days. We've got some fairly big cooler fans on them. Edson does experience some pretty good uh, heat in the summer. So we didn't see that kind of an impact necessarily on, on our production, but we did see some. And, of course, everybody, including uh, all, the, all the houses in Alberta, saw the effect on power prices in the, in the province for that week. We took a bit of a hit, obviously, on our op costs in the quarter due to that spike in pool prices. For that week, I think we saw prices jump from about 50 bucks a megawatt hour to, at times, $1,000 a megawatt hour. So, uh, unfortunately, pool prices uh, took a hit, and since we do consume some power for our refrigeration plants, um, our operating costs were a little bit higher in the quarter than what we would have liked, but 
those have since obviously come back down again. In general, I'd say uh, well results continue to come in better than expected, uh, particularly our extended reach horizontal wells that we're doing um, and our drilling down in the chambers area has been very successful. Uh, we're finally seeing, obviously, the, uh, the results down there, and we're also seeing the, the first of our results on the acquired lands in Cecilia, and those look really good. We do have uh, a couple of turnarounds to finish here in August, and then all those uh, great wells that we've been drilling will start to come on stream and, and boost our production from around the 90,000 barrel a day mark uh, up to the year end, where we expect to exit around 100,000 barrels a day just in time for winter. Speaking of gas price, the future strip has strengthened a lot over the last quarter or so, uh, such that our tight well economics um, look even stronger, uh, exceptionally strong in fact. Uh, those new economics are shown in our updated presentation on the website. Uh, we, we didn't get to see obviously the full effect of that increase in our realized prices and on our cash flows this quarter due to existing hedges, but as those hedges roll off, our realized price will rise substantially. Uh, that's also shown in the in the presentation. Um, that said, our, our realized Q2 prices were still way up from a, from a year ago, and, and that helped lift our cash flow close to 150 percent from 33 million in Q2 2020 to 82 million this past quarter. And we should see a substantially uh, greater lift even as we get into this winter, uh, and some of our basis differentials roll off even more. Cash costs. Uh, per MCF were a little higher than what we want, uh, mostly due to royalties and transportation, which are a couple of things we don't have a lot of control over. Um, we should see our OPEX and interest costs uh, continue to fall as we go forward, uh, especially as uh, our volumes go up, but also as our, our net debt comes down, and uh, we'll see lower interest payments. We are still, according to uh, my check of the industry, the lowest cost producer in the industry, as far as I'm aware, so uh, we're still well ahead of the rest of the industry. Obviously, the royalty costs have gone up substantially with higher commodity prices, and that's affecting everybody's cash costs, but uh, those controllables that we have, we're, we're keeping those costs down. So uh, good job for the team, uh, to the team in, uh, in keeping those costs in check. As far as uh, maybe a more recent update goes, we're excited that we're uh, building a new gas plant again, uh, this time down in our chambers area. It uses uh, a lot of equipment that we already have in inventory, and uh, it'll make uh, production in the Brazo area more efficient, as uh, right now our gas has to travel quite a distance to get to our, uh, our plant, and we'll be putting this plant uh, basically right on top of the reserves that we're developing down there. Uh, we're excited that this is going to be our most environmentally friendly and, and efficient plant that we've ever built. We're going to put as much new technology into this plant as we possibly can to uh, lower its emissions intensity. And, uh, and of course, this plant increases our infrastructure footprint in the Brazo area uh, significantly, which you know tends to give us uh, strategic control uh, and provides uh, additional processing flexibility, really, for the area because we'll have two plants now flexibility both to us and, and arguably uh, processing capacity even for, for others in the area. Speaking about environmental performance, we released our first ESG report in the quarter. Uh, that's also up on our website, and it talks at length about uh, all the environmental initiatives that we have on the go to lower our emissions intensity going forward, things we're working on today and what we expect into the future, all of which contribute to making our production uh, even greener. Natural gas, obviously, is, uh, is one of the greenest uh, hydrocarbon fuels that we have at our disposal today, and uh, we're trying to make ours as clean and green as, as possible for, for consumers. Longer term, um, you know, we've stated that we're investigating several options for carbon sequestration and underground storage. Uh, we have our Big Sunny uh, empty storage cavern right underneath our main operations in the Greater Sundance area that could come into play for that. Um, we've also been investigating several deep Devonian reef complexes that, that sit underneath the Greater Sundance area that we could potentially use for, for CO2 disposal and sequestration. So um, lots of good technology coming down the pipe, uh, and I think Canada will likely be a leader in the world when it comes to capturing and sequestering CO2. Uh, making our hydrocarbon industry uh, one of the cleanest in the world. So 
we're excited to be part of that. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the quarter. It was, uh, I think, both a solid quarter operationally and our financials are starting to improve. Uh, we're looking excitedly into 2022 uh, when things get sig significantly better for us even. And so uh, that's pretty, pretty exciting. But uh, Josh, why don't, uh, why don't I stop there and we'll throw the call open to any questions from those listening in. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A or else there. As a reminder, that's star then one to ask a question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Dan Nelson, private investor, you may proceed with your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, just wondering if you could give us a quick uh, update on your uh, CapEx spending for the full year now that you've added uh, another uh, drilling rig and you're going to start on the new gas plant uh, this fall. Uh, I think the old range was, what, 300 to 350? Yeah, that's right, Dan. Um, and I think we're still sort of targeting that upper end of the capital guidance at about 350. Um, we'll see towards the end of the year uh, how much uh, partner participation we see in some of the joint wells that we've got. That's a bit of a tricky thing to, for us to try and forecast. Uh, in the past, we were we were sort of forecasting that partners weren't going to be participating in wells, and then lately partners have been participating in wells, so that changes our net capital outlay. And so that's one of the things that can sort of provide a bit of variability to uh, to what our capital forecast is going to be. The, the new Chambers plant, um, we, we've got design underway going right now, obviously, and, and permitting and all the rest of it uh, well underway. We, we own all of the existing equipment, virtually all of it anyway, that we're going to be putting into that plant. So the early payments for new facilities we don't have in this particular plant. Really, a lot of the capital outlay is going to happen during the construction part of it, where the labor, obviously, and the, and the install um, is done. And I, I believe the majority of that is in Q1. Uh, just looking over at Todd Burdick here, or VP Production, and he's nodding his head that, yes, um, uh, we, we would typically say that a, a brand new plant, you know, might be at the upper end of cost, about a, a dollar per million cubic feet of uh, 1 million per million cubic feet. So if a, a 50 million cubic foot a day gas plant might cost upwards of $50 million to build. I think the budget for this one was lower than that, probably closer to about 40. But again, half of it is kind of the install cost and half of it is sort of the equipment cost. And so if all the equipment's already paid for, then really it's, it's less than 20 million that we would be looking to lay out for the installation at this plant site. Uh, I think we were thinking more like 17, 18 million, I think is what you guys were kind of uh, expecting. So really that 18 million of capital is likely to occur in Q1, not Q4. So it doesn't, this, this gas plant doesn't really affect our capital program for this year at all. Um, the, the fifth rig, as you mentioned, um, under normal circumstances obviously would increase our capital spending, but again, we're, we're sort of catching up to uh, capital that we didn't spend in Q2. Uh, we'll get get that uh, deployed here in, in Q3 and Q4 to catch us up to our schedule to get to that 350 number. And then a uh, little bit of uncertainty still uh, just with respect to where partners are. So, you know, that upper end of the guidance is where we're targeting, but it could be a, a little bit higher than that. It could be a little bit lower than that depending on uh, participation levels by partners in the last half of the year. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, incidentally, thanks for that uh, uh, comment on the possible uh, free cash flow at the uh, current strip prices and your CapEx plans over the next four years. That was a nice little nugget. So thank you for that. 
All right. Thanks for the question, Dan. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brent McLean with Private Investor. You may proceed with your question. Hi, Darren. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, as you get new production brought on in the coming months, if you're going to uh, hedge that production or will you allow that uh, new production to capture spot pricing? Um, you know, Brett, we have a pretty mechanical hedging program that sort of looks forward uh, into the future. We've got sort of levels that we're trying to get to. Um, there's sort of a stair-step profile that we're trying to continue to hold that we build out into the future. So we are still hedging uh, small amounts into the future. It's a, obviously a tough time to hedge because the current price is so much higher than the future price. The forward curve is backwardated quite steeply. Um, as, as I indicated in the in the press release, you know, 2022 prices, I think, are uh, what are they? Get what I put in here, even 330-ish, um, while you know 2023 276. So it, it does fall off pretty hard into the future, but you know we're we're still taking those future prices off the table slowly. Um, this is the challenge, obviously, in a in a rising price environment. You're going to see that backwardated forward curve, and the spot price is always going to be higher than the future price. But you know. The, the, that long-term future price is still very attractive for us. The economic return we generate on our on our drilling inventory is really good at 250 plus, and so you know anything over that is a real bonus. Um, the the spot price obviously is is higher, and, and in a rising price environment, that's going to be the case. Uh, in a you know in a falling price environment, what we had for the last almost decade, we were we were gaining on our hedges. And we would fully expect that probably in a rising price environment, we're going to be losing a little bit on our hedges on the way up because we're always going to be taking a lot of that future off the table. But, you know, I, I always have to remind everybody, including ourselves, that our hedging program is not designed to win or lose. It's really designed just to smooth out the future volatility. Um, and if at the end of the day we come out with zero gain, zero loss, then, then it's achieved uh, – everything it's supposed to achieve at no cost, which, you know, a future um, confidence in the price by having a, a fixed price out there in the future is like insurance. Typically, you have to pay a premium for insurance, some sort of uh, monthly premium. But in this case, you know, if we can get away with getting that insurance of commodity price and not having to pay any premium, then I think we're doing really well over the long term. But uh, you know, we fully expect to have hedging losses as the price is rising, um, and we'll have hedging gains as the price falls, and and that's just sort of the nat the nature of how we're forward selling. Um, but you know, as I mentioned before, the the forward price, er every forward price we look at looks very constructive to our economics. So we're happy to be a price taker and just take those future prices off the table. Thank you very much, Darren. You bet. Thanks for the question. Thank you. And as a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. Our next question comes from Jerry McAfee, the private investor. You may proceed with your question. Hi, Darren. Uh, the A um, uh, couple of questions, but the first is about bank costs, uh, interest costs, and uh, the increased bank charges that uh, had come on last year. Uh, I noticed the in the report that the uh, bank costs seem to have come down a bit. Uh, in a prior conference call, uh, the expectation had been that uh, somewhere around the fourth quarter, the effect of the improvement in the financials and its uh, impact on uh, extra bank charges, that that would um, be seen in the fourth quarter and that that was somewhere in the vicinity of uh, on an annual uh, excuse me on a quarterly basis about five million a quarter um, so question one is is that still the expectation or did some of that already come in question two also relates to debt is uh, if if you're able to uh, cast uh, further light on the plan in the new year around debt uh, and, for instance, there's a note coming up next September, uh, one of your higher cost ones. It's not bad. Uh, and, you know, $25 million came in 
uh, extra this quarter. I'm just wondering what our debt repayment uh, thoughts are. So bank charges and debt repayment. Thank you. Yeah, great question, Jerry. And I'm going to loop in Kathy sitting beside me here to talk a little bit about um, the interest charges that we're forecasting. Um, so, Kath, our grid is is such that as our debt comes down, our interest charges go down. That is correct. Um, but it comes down in steps. So, um, as our leverage comes down, um, then we then we have uh, a lower stamping fee, which is uh, the major component of our interest cost. So we have an underlying um, bank interest cost, which as we all know is extremely low, and then a stamping fee is based on leverage. So um, it has been quite high. So as that comes down, every reduction in uh, leverage will, will generate um, a kind of a, a, a movement to a lower grid. So we're going to see that in steps over the next while. So um, when we came back in compliance under 3.5, that generated a lower stamping fee, not the lowest by any means, but lower. Now in Q2, we came under three times, which will now on a future basis generate a, a lower stamping fee again. Um, so then we see that interest rate come down. And as we move down the leverage tier, we move down the stamping fee cost, and so we see over time a reduction in the interest rate to kind of a normalized rate of um, just over 4%, 4 percent, four point four and a quarter, whatever, including all uh, the notes, et cetera, would be our more our average rate. We're going to see that in 2022 um, more so. But by Q4 2021, I mean we should be we should be moving down to pretty normal rates. Yeah, and so to go even further, that's the interest rate. But as you mentioned, we are obviously reducing the debt that we're paying that interest rate on as well. Right. And so this year, uh, maybe not as much debt reduction as we're forecasting for next year. Next year, we're forecasting quite a dramatic debt reduction because our free cash flow jumped so much. Uh, we, you know, get rid of a lot of these hedging losses and a lot of the basis uh, deals that we had in place that were high cost, and our cash flows improved substantially, and that gives us a lot of free cash flow then to apply to the debt. That brings the debt down, and at the same time, the interest rate charged on that lower amount of debt is lower. So those two compounding factors obviously bring our total interest charges down every quarter that we're going out into the future by quite a bit. So of course the notes are the rates are fixed on those. So yeah. So that leads us to the next note uh, or the first note um, term date, which is September or no. Yeah, September, September of 22. 22. Um, so we're looking at options for those notes and in discussions with the lenders. Obviously, the rate that we are charged is going to be a big factor. Um, free cash flow would be a factor, but it's still a bit soon to have a definitive plan. The, the balance sheet is obviously getting quite a bit stronger, and so the concerns of that going forward are, are mitigated quite a bit. Um, there, there's still, I guess, an overall or underlying concern with respect to inflation and rising interest rates and how much debt do we want to carry into a rising interest rate environment if that's what we end up getting. Um, and, you know, we're looking closely at that, I, I think, with obviously all the debt that all the countries in the world have racked up. There's the expectation that we will get inflation and, and higher interest rates out there. Um, we need to make sure that we've prepared ourselves for that and, and ensure that either we can lock in lower rates or we're paying down debt to reduce our total indebtedness that we have to pay interest on. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Jared? Thanks. Yes, it did. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not showing any further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the call back over to Darren G. for any further remarks. Okay, thanks, uh, Josh. We did have a couple of uh, questions coming in overnight um, from uh, analysts and investors that we would like to address. Um, one of them I'd, I want to point to, to Dave Thomas, our VP Exploration 
there was a question just about uh, our chambers plant and the inventory, future inventory we have down there to, to support that brand new plant. Dave, can you maybe address that question? Yeah, sure, Darren. Uh, we have close to uh, 150 drilling locations on our chambers lands. Uh, it's a really good mix of cardium, not a Qin, and uh, Woolrich targets. And uh, that includes over 50 extended reach uh, uh, lateral wells. Assuming the outcomes remain similar to our current results, uh, we could keep the new chambers plant full for, for over 10 and a half years with, with uh, just that inventory. Uh, and, and that leaves plenty of scope to continue flowing extra gas up to our Brazil plant or, uh, or to expand the chambers plant uh, at some point in the future. Uh, we'll also continue to grow our chambers land position and to, to add to our existing inventory, just as we've done for years at uh, all our other plants. So this is just a snapshot in, in time, but it's, it's definitely looking uh, quite good down there right now. That's great. Thanks, Dave. Um, one of the other questions that came in was uh, with respect to you know, our ability to generate so much free cash flow over the next four years that we can completely eliminate our debt and the fact that at, at current trip prices anyway, our economics uh, look very attractive. Uh, so JP, maybe I can loop you into this question. Um, you know, the question is really, if our economics are so good and we've got so much free cash flow, why aren't we putting more capital to work uh, drilling more wells, growing production faster? Yeah, good question. I guess, uh, first of all, our, our type well economics, as we look at them today with the latest strip, um, you know, they have, they have, actually this is put on our website now, this uh, information is up, up there, our latest uh, template uh, for returns on our type wells. <clears throat> this, a lot of these wells are showing payouts of less than a year, or just uh, just over a year. So, I mean, obviously that's, that's, that's something that we haven't seen for quite a while. I mean, that's a lot to do with price, obviously, but also with the efforts of, the, of, of folks here trying to, uh, you know, get costs down and, and improve results too. Um, you know, the quick payouts certainly help with the, you know, with the capital allocation decisions, uh, since we can take future price uncertainty off the table, obviously. But your question, you know, so why don't we do more? You know, firstly, I think we should look, you know, we looked at our uh, five-year plan here, a model, where we continue to spend at the levels, uh, you know, we're at this year, say roughly $350 million of capital investment over the next five years, or this year and the next four years, you know, and it shows we can grow our production, you know, roughly about 7% per year, um, you know, depending on capital efficiency and, and decline assumptions, but um, that's, that, that we can do uh, well within uh, our projected cash flows, and, and we'll have significant uh, free cash flow available after that. But, um, we have to temper our enthusiasm, you know, as one of Canada's larger natural gas producers. We certainly don't want to flood the market uh, until, um, you know, egress is built out and, uh, and dry prices down. So, uh, you know, clearly the backward-aided uh, strip is expecting producers to, you know, to do just that. Uh, and so we'll need to have some restraint uh, or these great returns and quick payouts will go away. Yeah, no question. And I think that's a common theme uh, amongst the larger gas producers in Western Canada right now, um, which has probably led to the consolidation of uh, more of the uh, gas production in the basin. Um, we did a small acquisition at the start of the year, and Scott, one of the questions we got in was, uh, you know, are we looking at more acquisitions? Are we looking to consolidate the basin more? Or are we content with our, our land base today? Or what, what kind of opportunities are out there on the uh, M&A side for us? Yeah, Darren, uh, that, that Cecilia acquisition that re you're referring to um, was a very nice one. Uh, just in, in retrospect, uh, it was timed nicely with the gas price increase. So we like it. We, it fit in very well seamlessly to our existing operations. And, uh, and the upside, I think, as we've identified, uh, we've started to tap into that. And it's, uh, it's coming to fruition. So we're, we're looking at more of that, the stuff that plugs in that's you know if you look at uh, look at our past we haven't done a lot of acquisitions uh, we haven't needed to do a lot of acquisitions and that's one of the nice things about right now is we certainly we're, we're not in a position to have to do anything uh, we've got an extremely rich inventory as Dave has pointed out at, at chambers and other areas so it's nice to be in that position 
to you know, be very selective on what we, what we look at. And we're looking at stuff in the five to ten year range here to complement what we already have. Uh, the bolt-in stuff that fits in and, com and conforms to the, the attributes that we look for, low cost, infrastructure, strength, and, and uh, you know, the expertise that we have in drilling these uh, Cretaceous formations. Uh, but having said that, we're also looking, uh, you know, longer term at, at some other potential new core area uh, plays. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to force that. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the opportunities that, that make sense within the capital efficiencies and the use of our capital, um, you know, across the broad investment spectrum we have. But there, it, it's become a little tougher, obviously, with gas prices going up to get the, the deals, and we're seeing that in property transactions. Back when gas price was lower, we were looking at uh, deals done in that 10,000 per flowing barrel range, and you know that's more or less doubled here with the gas price increases. But uh, you, we'll continue to chip away at the areas that make sense where we have uh, a real competitive advantage uh, over over others. Super. Um, you, the, the question always comes in about inflation. Uh, obviously, that's very topical today, uh, both in the broader economy and also as it pertains to our business and are we seeing any inflationary pressures on our cost structure. And So we, we did, obviously, as we no noted in the press release, we've, we've pre-bought some equipment, well site equipment, um, we've pre-bought some pipe, uh, we've, we've got good relationships with our service providers, but Todd, maybe you can, and, and Lee's not here to comment, but maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about um, how we're mitigating some of that inflationary pressure if we are seeing it and, uh, you know, how long before we start to see some of it trickle into our business. Um, and, and maybe you can speak a little too about um, our, our environmental initiatives that we got going forward. Um, obviously, we're spending some money on lowering our environmental footprint uh, lowering our CO2 emissions intensity, uh, we, we we obviously are sort of killing two birds with one stone, buying lower emissions intensity well site equipment and buying it today to offset the the potential of inflation. So, can, can you speak to those two topics a little bit? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, yes, with um, some pretty major, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, supply chain disruptions with COVID and and other uh, I guess worldwide factors, uh, we are starting to see some some price uh, pressure, especially uh, anything steel related. You know whether it's tubing casing, uh, line pipe, valve, that sort of thing. So uh, we had an opportunity basically Q1, Q2 to um, get our hands on pipe that was on the ground already or get at least uh, in the queue for for pipe that's uh, uh, about to come out of the mills and, and we're able to secure some pretty good pricing on that front similarly with uh, the equipment that's uh, that goes into building separator packages um, you know heads and shells and that sort of thing uh, uh, getting ahead of that will, will help us for the next year um, you know, uh, with the Chambers plant, uh, I guess it's fortunate that, you know, we bought a bulk of that equipment, you know, five, six years ago. So um, I think were we to buy it today, uh, we'd be looking at quite a bit uh, different cost for this plant, uh, probably closer to that $1,000 uh, per million that, that you had alluded to. Um, as far as um, uh, the environmental front, so... Uh, you know, we've been uh, trialing and refining these, these low emission electric skids for the past two years. Uh, they went through two winter seasons. We really wanted to make sure that uh, there would be no major issues, uh, you know, through the winter. And, and we saw some pretty cold temperatures through that winter. And, you know, we've really been moving towards more uh, electrification since 2016 when we started putting, uh, or even earlier when we, you know, moved to SCADA and that sort of thing where we're running solar panels and batteries. So so we're learning and we've been learning for quite a while. And so 
uh, we were ready to, to really jump into the waters, if you, if you want to put it that way, uh, order these 80 skids. So uh, the, uh, the first two uh, are actually installed on a two-well pad that comes on this week. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as far as how far the, the last we expect, probably the end of Q2 next year. Uh, so we'll be probably early in, in 2022, we'll be looking again to secure some, some good pricing by ordering, ordering in bulk. Um, from an emissions perspective, these installations should reduce our total emissions by about four kilograms per BOE, which translates uh, to just over 2%. So that's our total emissions intensity. Um, and in addition to that, we sell an incremental 40,000 gigajoules of gas per year that normally would have been vented uh, into the atmosphere. So, um, you know, and, and of course, that's a further contribution to our goal of uh, an incremental reduction of our total emissions intensity by 25% by 2023. So, uh, we've got other things that are going on, retrofitting uh, pneumatic pumps in the field, uh, the things we're going to be doing at, at the Chambers plant uh, that it, we're, we're, you, you described in, in the announcement are all, are, will all move us towards that 25% reduction. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, I think that's, uh, that's all the questions that we had. I don't see any more up there, Josh. So. Um, you know, thanks uh, everyone for tuning in to the call today.